the brought in, changing the narrative of African higher education. No matter the circumstances we find ourselves in, the learning doors of our universities must still be open. And that is what Assess University through its collaborative and um, education collaborative seeks to achieve and to do. You can join or get interactive with us on all our social media platforms and also use the hashtag edu collaborative 2020. Today we have series of discussions. Um, we have about two panel discussions and also some key presentations um, for you. But to begin um, the, the conference virtually, the first topic we will be looking at COVID-19 test um, of Ghana's educational system. We'll be looking at the policy implications and also the new pathways as well. And we have seasoned expert and education giants on the continent and globally as well to help us do the discussion. And I believe that we are ready to get into the first um, discussion. I would introduce the speakers right away. My name is Chrissy Sam and I work with the Association of African Universities and I'm going to be a moderator for the first panel. And after we would have series of panels as well. Okay, so the first to be introduced, and this is not in any order, we are privileged to have the Honorable Deputy Minister of Education. And then he is also a member of the seventh parliament of the Fourth Republic of Ghana, representing the Bosumchi constituency in the Ashanti region. And this man or this gentleman is also the founder and the former chief executive officer of new designs charter schools in the USA. And these two schools have been, um, they have a combined enrollment of about 1,200 students in grade six to 12 in Los Angeles, specifically USA. And we are privileged to be hosting Honorable Dr. Yao Osei Educhu. Um, he is one of our panelists today. Second to be introduced is Professor Jane Nana Opoku Ajiman, and she is the Chancellor African Women's University based in Zimbabwe. Professor Nanopoku Ajiman is an educationist with extensive experience in government and university management as well. She is a formal education minister of the Republic of Ghana and the first female vice chancellor of a, a public university in Ghana. And that is the University of Cape Coast from 2008 to 2012. And the third panel member to be introduced is Dr. Nemo Thompson and he is a former director general, National Development Planning Commission. He is also an experienced economist and a former director general of the National Development Planning Commission. And he has also worked as a senior economist in the New York State Bureau of Fiscal and Economic Analysis in New York City. He, is all, he also worked with several local and international organizations, including the United Nations Development um, Program which he served as a senior economic advisor in South Africa. He has co-authored several research papers and specifically in 2008, he co-authored Financing and Outcomes of Education in Ghana and a recent um, article, Dead Knowledge in Our Schools. So I'm so much excited to be hosting these um, gallant and um, wonderful experts and educationists on our continent um, to discuss the test of COVID-19 on Ghana's educational system and also know the policy implications and a new pathway. So lady and gentlemen, if you can hear me well, welcome to Education Collaborative 2020 brought to you by Ashesi University. Thank you for having me. This is Nemo here. Great. All right, um, can we hear the voice of uh, Prof Nana and then also um, the Deputy Minister? Yes, I'm, I'm here. I'm honored to have been invited to be part of this panel discussion. Great. All right, we are excited to host um, you and most especially um, what you have been doing in the space of um, education during this uh, pandemic. And we would start with you, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister. We would want to find out from you as, um, specifically what has been the strategic intervention um, and then the measures that have been adopted by the Ministry of Education and the Ghana Education Service to combat the pandemic, um, uh, by keeping the learning doors of our schools open. And we want to know what the government has been doing 
right from basic, senior high, and tertiary education. In five minutes, we want to find out what specifically you have been able to do until today. You have the floor, and I will take you that. That's a lot of time to talk about what we have done. <laughs> exactly. But we know in five minutes, you'll be able to give us a brief one. Thank okay. you. I, I, I just want to uh, say a very good morning to your uh, audience and uh, to also um, say hello to uh, fellow uh, panelists. I just want to say that COVID-19 uh, has literally uh, changed uh, education as we know it. I've, I've, been saying that as we see it now, we have uh, COVID-19 and patient as strange bedfellows. Uh, but within that mess, uh, we see, I personally see a lot of opportunities. Uh, yes, we are in a pandemic and people want to talk about the challenges, but I see more opportunities, opportunity for us to begin to look at uh, areas that we have never looked at before. Uh, when you talk about e-learning, I always say that in that space, in Ghana, we were uh, probably crawling or at best we were walking and the pandemic made us run. Because if you look at the uh, interventions that was done at the basic school level, uh, from primary to senior high school, uh, learning through TV, which, uh, and then now radio, and all the things that have been ruled out. Uh, the COVID-19 actually gave a sense of urgency that something needed to be done and needed to be done quickly. We've also realized that COVID-19 have come to really uh, expose certain areas. Uh, and I'll not even say in terms of education, in terms of society as a whole, the issue of the digital divide uh, literally have been uh, not, have not been something that we confronted very well as a nation. We digitize in very many areas, but you digitize and you don't bridge the digital divide, then you're creating a nation of haves and have-nots. Uh, those who have access to technology are going to take advantage of opportunities in the country, and those who don't are going to have challenges. And that became clear when uh, COVID-19 um, arrived on our shores and the challenges it brought made it uh, an imperative that our universities, for example, um, fully rolled their instruction online. And then you began mm -hmm. to see where uh, families, households without computers, uh, the challenges uh, they were facing, or without some kind of a smart uh, device. So I think, if anything, um, the opportunities that are there also comes with some uh, challenges that we need to confront head on and not just see it as an educational issue. We have to see some of these things as societal issues because I know Minister of Communication over the years and, and the different governments have done a fantastic job uh, rolling out various interventions, uh, technology IT centers in various districts and communities, and it has done that very well. But now you come to see that yes, you can do the IT center, but when COVID-19 came, we couldn't go to the IT center. Uh, but if uh, families have access to uh, computers and other devices, they could have gotten access to the uh, highest level of learning uh, from the comfort of their own home. So now you have to see that even when we talk about other societal challenges, uh, we're going to have to confront it in a different way and begin to see how access uh, to computers, for example, is just like access to TV or any other device for that matter. How do we conscientize our people to understand that in the same way that we're able to acquire um, a TV for the home, a computer will be good for the family? And there are some other things that you can do even on your smartphone. So I, I think um, uh, the COVID-19 challenges that have been confronted uh, in terms of, uh, for example, at the junior high school level and senior high school level, uh, ensuring that there's access to instruction on TV and at the senior high school level specifically, creating an online portal called the iCampus uh, is something that has also supported uh, the deployment of digitized content that had been developed previously um, by Sendlos. And, and that is something that is now available and students can use it for instruction. But basically, we need to confront the issue of digital divide. All right, that, 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 that's very great. I like the fact that you 
want us to focus much more on the opportunities um, that um, COVID has brought to us. But specifically, I want to know your experience as a deputy minister. How was it um, for you at the forefront, making sure that all these um, interventions rolled out by the government went? How, how was it for, for you? If we want you to share your experience personally, what, what will you tell us in the space of maybe a minute? I, I, I think one of the things I saw was that if you look at the content that had been developed by Sandros, this was developed for years ago, and, and it mm. came in handy. <laughs> it was very interesting because of quality content uh, began um, and the, uh, under the previous regime before we took over, we continued, uh, we were able to have some quality content in math and, and science and other elective areas. And that was immediately rolled onto TV and onto the iCampus platform. But we should mm. also understand that it was in no way supplanting regular instruction. It was a mm -hmm. way where you intervened to prevent what is known in education as learning loss. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that the students were not sitting idle. So, so that was mm -hmm. done within that context. So make, uh, we should not make any assumption that that was replacing what the students would have been taught at school. And therefore, uh, there was an assessment. There was no learning management system that accompanied it. And I think as we move forward, those are things that we need to put in place that you can have schools rolled out online like mm -hmm. other private schools have done. And within that context, you have to also confront the issue of the digital divide. So you can roll it online, but how are uh, the families going to get access uh, to that quality content? But I just want to say that the content that had already been prepared came in handy. And with that, some content was deployed so that our students could have access to at least some kind of instruction and, and some kind of content um, uh, from their TVs and also on on the iCampus uh, through their computers. Great, thank you very much. And I think this is where uh, we bring in Prof Nana to, to really look at the policy implication of, of COVID. Looking at the interventions, Prof, um, that we have been able to put across as a country and even as a continent, with your background, what do you think uh, must change or what are some of the policy implications that are very much relevant going forward? Yeah, thank you very much, Casey. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, very well, we can hear you. Wonderful. So let me say good morning to my fellow panelists. And again, to thank you for this kind invitation. Uh, what must change? Many things must change. We know that uh, we have very serious challenges in our education, in the mm. entire system. The COVID has brought so many of them to our faces, so we can no longer ignore them. I hear the Honorable Deputy Minister refer to um, iCampus, we went on to do the eyeball and all of that. When we started that one, it, uh, no, when we advanced from iCampus to iCampus Ghana, what we were seeking to do, and as he has said, he has mentioned science and math, what we saw was that the performance in these areas was not so good. So many students were learning, I mean, repeating the subjects and so on and so forth. So we thought, how do we make this a little more easy? So the content in the I campus comes from the syllabus. So it's not something that we needed to, um, to re recreate. And Sendlos is one of our agencies. Having met all the agencies and, and found out what it is that they do, how it was that they could all bring their expertise to help our own children pass these subjects that we have made compulsory because we think they are important. So the mm -hmm. result that I think part of it is what the um, Honorable Minister is speaking about. At the same time, we also know that we have distance education in this country. Yes. We have distance education at the University of Cape Coast. I was privileged to be part of that committee those days when we were setting up the distance education. And what some of us asked was that what skills are the distance learning bringing to the learning experience? So, what should happen? And so on. So, yes, we had all these gadgets. But again, we needed to ask ourselves, how does a learner, him or herself, position themselves to be able to access this content? Because the distance learning assumes someone who can self-learn. So it was also important at that time when I got to the ministry that maybe this is time for us to visit the training of the teachers themselves. I'm sure we'll come into this. Yes. But for the time being, it was to reach many people who were not in the net already 
we were to reach those who had been in the net and had fallen out. And so, you see, when at the time we were emphasizing reading, it was for a reason. You put mm. it on the screen, the person must read with understanding to make all these gadgets and so on that you have put in place meaningful. And then again, you need to go back and ask yourself, mm -hmm. for what? How does everything we are doing here interface with our economy, for example? The students will graduate. Where do they go? How do they fit? So you see, when we started distance education, at least at the University of Cape Coast, our initial focus was on teachers because we noticed that we had a huge number of untrained teachers. And the problem of getting a teacher to leave their home, come to live on campus, it just wasn't working. So how can we keep the students, sorry, how can we keep the teacher at the school so that evenings or weekends, the person can learn? So that was the beginning of introducing even more blend, blended learning methodology. And at mm -hmm. the same time, encouraging our colleagues on campus Hello, Prof. I think we seem to have a slight challenge with uh, Prof's network. Hello, Prof. Nana, can you hear us? I can't hear her either. OK. Maybe we'll give a minute to see if she would come back. And um, if she's unable to do so, we will proceed to the next speaker. All right, so um, let, let me bring you in, Dr. Thompson. Um, listening to what Professor Nana has already um, said, and then the Deputy Minister, what do you what will be your initial submission before we move into your discussion? Well, thank you very much once again for the opportunity. I think they both make very uh, substantive and interesting uh, contributions. And as an economist, I'm interested. Uh, uh, in the socioeconomic implications of everything. And when the min deputy minister spoke, he used the expression strategic interventions, and I took particular interest in that, because what that means is that we are looking at interventions beyond the, the solutions we are providing today exactly. and looking at it, their implications for the future, long after the minister is gone, long after his government is no longer in power, and we have successive uh, generation of Ghanaians who will be affected in one way or another. And so I was very happy that he at least recognizes the strategic implications of our force. Those are the initiatives. We also need to be able to pay attention to the content, and both of them have mentioned content at various times, and I'm happy that they, they have, and I, I would really, really love to see that a lot more emphasis uh, is paid to the quality of content than we have uh, in the past. As you said in your introduction, I, a couple of years ago, I wrote an article called Dead Knowledge. And it was just by accident. I was looking at my daughter's uh, senior high school economics textbook, and I was amazed as, at the number of factual errors, uh, mm. misrepresentations, bad grammar, so many things wrong with the textbook on economics. Of course, when you're using a, a, an economic textbook, it's not just economic, but also the writing quality and all that. Uh, and, and that then led me to review other things and even read more. And, and you have authorities in education telling us, and I cite all that in the article, complaining about the quality of legal education, the quality of, uh, health, medical education, and so forth and so forth. So I hope as we make these strategic interventions to quote the minister, we will pay particular attention to the content. Just to wrap up, just was it two weeks ago, my daughter is also home like all other university children and she's been receiving slides uh, to prepare. Like she received one in economics. I took a look at it, the information there was wrong. But that's what she's been taught. So I called her to the side and I explained the, the difference between what she's been taught and what the correct one is. I, as I said, yeah, I really don't know what to do. When she was in JHS and I found an error like that in a textbook, 
I went to the school and explained to the teacher, but the teacher herself couldn't do much about it. But we have these problems. And the advantage of digital content is that you can identify uh, errors or misrepresentations like that and fix them as quickly as possible. And so I hope we tap fully into these advantages and as, as we uh, execute these strategic interventions. But I, I congratulate them on what they've done. And as uh, Professor Jane also said, they had actually laid the groundwork. So this is a, a cumulative iterative process, which leads me to my last point, that given the very fundamental nature of education reforms, we need as a nation to develop a culture of forming consensus on education reforms. It shouldn't be a partisan issue that my party is in government and therefore we will do it the way we, we see it fit. And, and I'm, just, I'm not just talking about what is going on now, but also what happened in the past with respect to three-year, four-year controversy, for example. As a nation, we need to recognize the limitations of partisanship in educational reforms. Because as I said, they affect more than the minister and their government. They affect Ghanaian societies for years to come, and therefore we need consensus in carrying out educational reforms. All right. Um, I think that, that that is very um, critical in, in, in such a moment. But we have Prof. Nana coming back again. We wanted to complete her submission. And then we'll come back to you to find out what we must do in terms of educational planning and how do we even finance and support um, educational system in terms of infrastructure. And you know, once you're moving into blended learning, that is what some uh, experts are proposing. What do we need to do as a country to really ensure that on top um, of our list, uh, that is education, we, we are really getting everything right. But now, if you can hear us, you can complete your, your submission now. Yeah, actually, I don't know why I lost you or why you lost me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, so I'm not sure why I lost you so that I can continue if necessary. But I, yes, I was talking about the... Mm. Uh, about what it was that we did that we can all build on. Education is not, and I agree with Dr. Nimoy Thompson, it's not a question of a term. If you look at the countries whose educational systems we admire, we should look at the last time they had a reform. From uh, Gagesberg until the recent one, Ghana has had some 13 reforms, too, too many, too often. Therefore, we never have the time to allow any system to calcify so we can study it and make interventions along with our economy. Education does not exist for itself. It exists for a purpose. And, the, and therefore, the short-term interventions, we need to stop that. I agree with the long-term planning, not only with education, but many things that we do. Because if you start anything, let's say with a six-year-old in class one, and then in eight years or four years, you stop it. Have you forgotten that it has affected somebody for four years? So I agree with mm. that, and I don't want to belabor the point. But the point I was making about distance learning, the point I was making was that, yes, the COVID has exposed many of our gaps. But what I'm trying to say is that the gaps existed, many of the gaps existed already. We had children who were not out of school. When we talk about leaving no one behind, for me, it raises two images. One is... Where is the queue? Is are people in the queue already that may be left behind? Or there are many who are not even in the queue at all. We have people who are self-learning. All of these are on our hands. If you look at the statistics from UNESCO, I think it was when we were ending the MDGs. We saw our own figure in our own country about all the almost half a million of children who were not in school. What do you do about them? For example, now we have the complementary basic education. Did all our interventions affect them? I know that this came, it just came upon us. Nobody was prepared. I admire the efforts that have been put in so far. But what I'm saying is that we had the warning signs. We were doing schools as usual. We had our computers in the schools. The next step was to ensure that the teacher was using the computer not for computer classes only. You can use the computer to teach any subject. We need to move there so that the, the learners get used to this form of teaching. So that mm. if at any point they have to do their homework, and as the Honorable Minister said, it has also 
uh, um, expose the gaps in our own lives, uh, which we know already. We, I mean, none of us can say that we don't know that um, uh, it's not everywhere in this country that has electricity. We know that. So that in our planning and so on, we need to pay attention to all of this. So that as I said, if the learners will, le will be exposed to this kind of learning in the classroom, let's say they go out. How about the library? The Ghana Library Board is under the Ministry of Education. Could that space also be used for self-learning? These are all things. How about the community centers? How about so many places that are closed over the weekend? Can we, can we communicate or can we collaborate rather with the stakeholders to help our children learn in these places by distance? So that you see, as I said, nobody forced. I never knew there would be a lockdown in this country, let me confess. Mm -hmm. And therefore, to have prepared so well for it. So we cannot put education on the carpet for this. Okay, but what I'm saying is that there is enough that we could be using so that when the time of crisis comes, we can fall on it. But in this case, if there's lockdown, the child cannot even go out anyway. And as he has said, uh, yes, so parents may understand they need to buy this and that. There are those who just cannot afford those things. And therefore, we need to stimulate the community center learning. And this is why, you know, we did the community schools so that all the kids in those areas who go into those places when with proper distancing and so on and so forth, can be able to continue learning. Because we've all been 15 before. We've all been 14 before. Even when the teacher is before you every day, how much of it do you retain? You know, let alone um, the distance away from school for so long. And it's not just the distance, it's the uncertainty, the fear of illness, so many things, you know, impacting your environment. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, all I'm saying is that we have something. I'm glad he mentioned iCampus. There was also the iBox. Let us continue with this, regardless who is going and who is not coming. These are important for our nation. They are important for our children. And therefore, we should continue with them. We shouldn't just fall on them because we don't have a choice. We should use them because it is necessary. And even when we, let's say, thank God we go to a normal, normal time, we still know there are many learners left behind. Mm. We still know there are many people who are learning on their own. We know there are so many people who are repeating their subjects. Look at every corner in Accra, some remedial class somewhere or the other. When we did the research at the ministry, we found the subjects that were bothering the children. I knew that at the university already, but I thought that, you know, let's do this work and bring everybody on board to see the data. So what did we do? And what should we continue to do? And you know, it is more than the screen. It is also the methodology. Prof, yes. Prof, I think we, we really do get your point and they are very factual. But um, in terms of national building and in terms of educational planning, um, if we would want to ask you what exactly, if you would um, want to ask you five key things that we think the Ministry of Education and the Ghana Education Service and all education providers in the country and even on the continent must adopt or adapt. What are the five key things that you think are, ne are necessary or needful for us to implement? That's a good question, but I'll try. I think that in view of everything going on, one a major, major area for me will be training. Training not only the faculty, not the teaching staff only, but the support staff only. And more importantly, the students to be able to use multiple sources of learning. And I'm not just talking about Google or Google Scholar. I'm talking about many other interventions that we can create. That's number one. I'll also ask for a review of our syllabus especially at the point of training. And here I'm referring to, let's say, the colleges of education, where our teachers are coming from. We have the mm. TTL. I don't know where it's at now. But it is a model that you can revisit and reconfigure. And then you must also pay attention to the teachers who are in, in the field already. So some refresher courses, and then to try and fix the problem from the source, which is where the teachers are trained. I'll also say that we need to look at 
upgrading our equipment or purchasing more, but I, I would like to suggest at this stage that we avoid the importation of finished products. We have our engineering department, we have our ICT department, you'll be amazed what they can do. Mm. If they can assemble, if they can fine tune, and I'll give the example of UCC, I'll come to your other two points if I can uh, follow it. When we were faced with long queues of students who were registering, I used on campus, I always went for very early morning work. And then you see them 435 already queuing for the offices to begin at eight. What did we do? Well, I just called the student. And I said, listen, this, uh, this is a problem for us. It's also a problem for you. What should we do? And you'll be amazed that the students who develop the software that we are using till today, we're not even uh, IT students. And I remember teasing the dean and the students that I was going to close the department because it came from one student was in education, another was in language, another was in religion. So you see, we have all this wealth that we can use. I also will suggest that we introduce blended learning while students are on campus so that we can help them to fine tune their learning habits and so that they can apply the same while on distance. How many have I said so far? You said four. Four, okay. And very, very importantly, uh, okay, uh, let me add quality assurance. How do you mm. measure the quality of learning? It's all about quality. So all these points I'm making about syllabus and staff and so on and so forth is to ensure that you are raising the quality of learning outcome. As I said, the education is for a purpose. So you need to set up a very, very good quality assurance mechanism. Have a way mm. of measuring how students are, are progressing. Find a way of measuring how learners or how uh, facilitators are, are progressing. And then pay attention to, the, to, the, um, to those subjects that have their basis in practical. And I'm talking okay. about the third people. I'm talking mm. about the science students and so on and so forth. Are they going to use simulators? How are you going to acquire them? How, you know, so many things that we need to do. So I'm very happy about this conversation. I think I've exhausted my five points. So Great, really thank you very much. <laughs> exactly. So let, let's, let's go back to um, Dr. Newmore Thompson and you are an economist and um, an education as well. Based on the submissions of uh, Prof. Sanana, looking at um, issues of quality assurance, issues of teaching, issues of capacity development. Looking at it from an economics point of view, in terms of financing, um, education in Ghana, and even at the continent, what, what do you think we must do vis-a-vis -vis looking at other pressing needs of the country? What must we do to ensure that, number one, we are on top of our issues as a continent or as a country in terms of education and doing the right thing right? Well, thank you very much. Um, the first thing we need to do is to prioritize, but perhaps even before that, as a, as a foundation, we need to recognize the financial limitations of any government, certainly including our government too, so that we don't go on a spending spree or embark on initiatives simply because they were promised in the manifesto. And we hear that a lot. We are doing this or that because it was in our manifesto. Manifestos typically are prepared outside of reality. Uh, those who are preparing are simply dreaming. And there's nothing really wrong with dreaming, but it, it must be grounded in reality. So when you eventually come to power and you see the reality, you need to be able to modify those ambitions or dreams. And we don't do a lot of that. And I speak specifically with the free SHS in mind in terms of prioritizing and making sure that we uh, utilize our limited resources in a very efficient way. Do we need free SHS? Of course, everybody recognizes that. I'm glad that Professor Jane said that, uh, and I wrote that down, that education doesn't exist uh, on its own. It must serve a larger purpose, and certainly free SHS will contribute to that in terms of building the human uh, resource needs of the country for our national development. But there are aspects of it that we really need to scrap, such as free boarding schools, uh, it's needless because the children have already spent 11 years of their lives 
living at home and going to school? What's an extra three years? Why can't they do that? Rather, we are putting up children, uh, providing accommodation, providing meals, spending all sorts of monies that their parents could ordinarily do, and they have already spent 11 years doing that. That money could be spent on doing the kinds of things that uh, Prof. Alia spoke about, such as uh, teacher training, all sorts of incentives, building the infrastructure for monitoring the quality of education. Otherwise, it's, there's going to come a point where we spread ourselves so thin, nothing works. We are trying to educate, but the quality is low because the resources are not there. That takes me to a much bigger issue that actually goes beyond the Ministry of Education, and it's a systemic government-wide problem, which is the nature of budgeting in Ghana. Rather strangely and sadly, we stopped doing capital budgeting as far back as 1997, 1999 rather. So strictly speaking, yes, you see various ministries with programs for building this or that, but they are not structured in traditional rigorous capital budgeting framework. And so we are building and building and suddenly since free SHS, the government has gone on a building spree of infrastructure to accommodate people in boarding schools that we shouldn't do without having the capital uh, budgeting framework to guide us. Because for every CD you spend on capital uh, project, you need about 10, 15 CDs in the future just to manage mm -hmm. around those facilities. And if you don't do that, they have implications for your budget. And that has been our undoing as a, as a nation for years. And I'm, I'm speaking across governments now because 2019 made it the 12th year in a row that we exceeded our wage bill. <laughs> so our revenue, we missed revenue targets in nine out of those 12 years. But if for re wage bill, we exceeded it every single year and almost all of it was in education. So we are basically as idealistic as we are, we are also creating an unsustainable system, especially when you look at the government's own projections from the 2020 budget, where it is projecting a steady decline in economic growth rate between now and 2022. It's supposed to, well, originally before COVID, it was supposed to be 6.8, then eventually it will go all the way down to 4.6. That has implications for your revenues. That has implications for your capacity to finance education. So two things before I wrap up. It's good that we think big and, uh, and we have all this in the long-term National Development Plan, which is popularly known as the 40-year plan. We cover the entire spectrum from basic all the way to tertiary. We looked at quality in terms of input, quality in terms of output. We made a whole range of recommendations and also strategies for financing education, including, including uh, a reform or uh, a revision of the GET Fund, which originally, if my memory serves me right, was proposed to uh, provide infrastructure at our tertiary institutions. Along the way, it was perverted. And I personally did not know that it had been changed until as a government official, I would travel abroad and people would come to me and say, Dr. Okay, Thompson, when you go back to Ghana, please follow up on my Get Fund scholarship. That's when I realized that they were actually using Get Fund scholarship for places like Harvard and all that. And then I checked Harvard's endowment Harvard has a $40 billion endowment compared to Ghana's GDP of $66 billion. So we need mm -hmm. to make critical analysis and on the basis of that, make strategic decisions. Why should a poor country like Ghana help finance Harvard's uh, resource mobilization strategy? Because it is part of their resource mobilization strategy to get African leaders to think that, listen, if you come to Harvard and spend two weeks, it's good for your CV. But it's also putting pressure on your city, on your currency. So we need to take these critical uh, uh, views as we approach these quote unquote strategic interventions. And I can't help but keep referring to that because the term strategic interventions, it is so loaded as opposed to let's say operational interventions that have immediate and don't always have that kind of profound long lasting effect. So that's pretty much what I'd like to say at this point, how we handle, how we finance education. I know that the president is insistent Free high school education to be free and so forth. Nothing wrong with day schools. I believe that should be 100% free. No one should pay. But the time has come for us to reconsider the role of boarding schools in our education infrastructure. Do they even need to exist? At the time they started them, Ghana was largely a rural country. 
And so it made sense to bring people from Gambaga, uh, Timpoko, and all that to a small. Now we are, we are now a majority uh, urban area. And it's, we, have, we started with community secondary schools. Why don't we endow or give each and every one of them the resources to provide the best education for every child in their own community? Why must you travel all the way from Accra to Cape Coast just to get the best education when it's possible in your community? All right. Um, thank you very much. I think um, that, 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 that is quite very extensive and a bigger discussion for another session. But we want to go back to the, the Deputy Minister based on the submissions that we've had from Prof. Nana and then um, Dr. Nimo Thompson in terms of financing education, in terms of um, our, our state um, with respect to resources. What is the strategy of the government? What is the strategy of the ministry um, right now, the president has really given out some guidelines for the resumption of schools. What is the strategy in terms of teaching, learning, quality, um, assurance, and, and also making sure that schools are basically doing exactly what we expect from them? What is the strategy of the ministry at this point? I, I, I think it's important that I, re <laughs> I respond to some of the issues that have come up. Uh, Very well. So that your, your uh, audience uh, will begin to understand um, uh, some of these issues are from a different perspective. What sure. we all need to understand is that the relationship between education and economic development is now proven. Countries that have transformed themselves did not look at their bauxite and gold and cocoa, which are all good things. But education mm. has, is now not just a piece of the puzzle, it's a whole puzzle. And in a knowledge economy, how well you deliver education is going to determine how your country gets transformed. Uh, so when we talk about all these things, we need to situate it as a developing nation, situate education within a proper context. Begin to look at the key performance indicators in education that leads to economic transformation. And once you identify them, it creates a sense of urgency for you to look at what do I do, what should I not do? Because you know in education, the three most critical things are access, quality, and the relevance of the education system to your socioeconomic fortunes or transformation. And you need to begin the adventure of education transformation within this context. Now, if you miss any one of them, you are in trouble. Uh, if you focus on access to the detriment of quality or to the detriment of the relevance of your education system towards the socioeconomic transformation, you've missed the boat. Now, once you look at all this three, you begin to look at the fact that there's need for leapfrogging opportunities. Because you see, the, the, a book was recently published by a Brookings Institution, and they talked about the fact that it will take developing nations like ours 120 years before we can catch up uh, with the education system of developed nations. And then, as you read the book further, one of the things they recommended was that you need to leapfrog inequality. Leapfrogging inequality means you need to come up with innovative systems and approaches and strategies that will move you from, from, uh, from point A to uh, B, so to speak. Now, how do you do that? If you talk about um, uh, access, for example, when you hear the free senior high school and people are saying, yeah, we have to wait. And, and I heard my, my colleague talking about the fact that uh, the boarding schools are not necessary. I uh, go to Chebidi and you're going to realize that if you put a community day school there, the number of students that will be able to access is so limited because some people may have to walk distances or uh, there are places where there's no trotter to bring them to the school. So it's not that simple. If you do community schools like uh, what at the NDC did um, at Kwabinya, uh, the one at Frafraha in Kumasi, at Great Kenzima, good locations, it attracted the students. But if you want to put community school as it was done, at Drobonso, you get the school done and the school is done. But who comes to the school? The village folks are not working and the roads are not done in a way that can get them there. So it's not that simple. It's not so simple as to make it feel like, why don't you do it? So easy to do. It's not that easy to do. Uh, attempt has been made and the implementation has been very difficult. Now, you, you look at the three main things, access. Then you ask yourself, why is access important? If you're going to look at the importance of access from education standpoint, linking up with economic transformation, one key indicator you need to track, for example, at the tertiary level, is your gross tertiary enrollment ratio. Countries that have developed, 
And mm -hmm. you can look at every indicator, and you're going to see that one of the most important things is your gross tertiary enrollment ratio. That is, if you take the youth between the ages of 18 to 23, out of every 100, how many of them are in some kind of tertiary education? And if you look mm -hmm. at our numbers in Ghana, it's about 17% now. Uh, South Korea is nearly 3.6. Figure it out. Other countries that have transformed themselves tackle the issue of access. Then you have to look at the quality. Very critical. If the quality is poor, access is high, you have to, you're going to have a problem. So the, I, I agree uh, that we need to do some balancing and you cannot improve quality when education administration is being done on the whim, so to speak. Hello, if you can, the key point is that, so what is the strategy of the government now? Um, you've listed a lot of Strategy things, is one, access. We've improved mm -hmm. access at the secondary level by over 50%. Uh, you talk about 800,000 students in senior high schools, and now it's 1.2 million. So you have attained access. Then you look at the curricular reform that we have embarked upon to improve quality. And not only that, leadership training. Now we are training school leaderships, uh, school administrators, to make sure they have the requisite skills to lead schools. So that leadership training as important component of quality. Mm -hmm. And then something that we took over and continued the teacher program, improving that in this world, we, we continue uh, with the support of the DFID, and that was to improve teacher training. Because if you don't improve teacher training, you are not going to improve the quality. So now we added one more year to teacher training to make it four years, like other places around the world. And that, uh, with what we built on from where we, what we inherited, is now going to produce more qualified uh, teachers who are going to be able to bring about the quality that, that we need. But you have to begin to look at the relevance of the education system. I know it has been a general policy that we need to increase the number of students in STEM. Yes, that is the general policy. But you need to have a... Yes, but Honorable Minister, plan. okay, all right. So how, how do we do this uh, in the spectrum of COVID-19? How did, What you are listing um, are things that are policies and things that the ministry seeks to achieve. But looking at where we are now as a continent, yeah. looking at where we are now as a country, how do I, we... I, the COVID-19... COVID uh, you have to look at your facility design, for example. Within Absolutely. the short term, short term, you need to look at your social distancing. Other countries have begun schools, they've opened schools, there have been challenges in some places. You really have to be meticulous in your planning and implementation process. For example, we've said that in senior high schools, as the president directed, you cannot have more than 25 students mm -hmm. in a class. And we're able to do that because a vast majority of the students are at home. Now, you have to begin to think beyond that and see how do we ensure the social distancing, short-term, medium-term, long-term. How do you change your facility design? How do you change your classroom design? How do you change your instructional time design? You see, we, we had uh, people complain about double track. Now, uh, all nations that are embarking on school opening, a number of them are using similar approaches. Because you have to find a way in the short term to really reduce class sizes. And if you cannot build all the facilities that you need to ensure you have 25 students in a class, short term you can't. Mm. What we need to do is to find some management strategy and approach that will make sure that every student will have access to instruction during the school year. So COVID-19 era is now bringing to the fore how do you manage your access and resources in such a way that students will have access to education, then you have to look at what are the logistics. Sanitizers a year ago were not a requirement to be supplied to schools. Now it's a requirement. Schools have to have okay. them. You have to look at nose masks. It's a requirement. If you don't have it, you can do school. So there are a number of things that are happening now that we need to confront. But as we look at the short term, look at long term, look at how technology can help us in terms of some of this distance as our prof uh, rightly pointed out blended learning a very good innovative strategy that we need to be looking at whether you do brick and mortar and you blend it with online learning so that you have that opportunity to reduce class sizes and and actually exist during COVID-19 and after COVID-19 begin to look at different pathways for learning um distance education Absolutely. for example why do you have to send a professor to go to Tamale to teach in a distance education program when you can do either asynchronous or synchronous 
online learning where the student can sit in Tamale, Bogatanga, and see the professor from uh, Cape Coast. So these are opportunities that are coming back. Uh, exploiting the opportunity means we also have to keep our children safe at this time and, and make sure that we don't put children in harm's way when it comes to education delivery. All right. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, we'll bring in Prof. Nana. And Prof. Nana, we want you to give us perspective on the, at the continental level. Um, what are some of the strategies that educators, educational institutions are adopting that you think uh, will be much more helpful in our context within um, two minutes before we go to the Q&A session? Hello, Prof. Nana, can you hear us? Hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, wonderful. What I was, I just wanted to comment very briefly about the community based schools. Honorable mm. Minister, you and I know that all these schools that today we fight to put our children in did not begin in the cities. And by bringing the young people to the cities, you know the problems too that they face. So when we're talking about the quality, the relevance, these are all important um, markets. If the school is far, what makes it so far? From where? What happened to the road? How did the school get there? How about transportation? How about other ways of transporting the children there? Exactly. And you know, if you are talking about double tracking in COVID situation, the double track we had was in a non-COVID situation. It has become like the norm. Today we are talking about the new normal. So please, um, Mr. Minister, let, let's put these issues aside. And again, you were talking about uh, the Brookings uh, document about leapfrogging. We should have our own vision of education. Who are we imitating? And for what reason? When we talk about the relevance, what does it mean? So he said, Mr. Minister, we should, we, we should be having all these conversations. Because in the end, it's about your children and mine. It's about the nation. So let us not raise this issue of um, community day school as if they cannot be used. You and I know that. I, I, I never said they cannot be used. No, no, no. I, I didn't say that, so don't allow get to me. me to finish. No, no, no. Please, I, didn't right. I didn't say that. To finish. I didn't All I'm say saying that. is that you have given such a connotation. You know, who will go there? They should put them in Frafraha and uh, wherever else that you need. When Wesley Girls started, you know the road they used to get there. But people went there because they knew they would get quality education. By it's education it was can be given anywhere, anytime, depending on the variables of quality education that you have outlined and how you meet each of these benchmarks. So I just want to put that out there. Now, talking, coming to your question about um, what it is that at the continental level we can do, of course, there's so much that we can, number one, there's so much that you can learn from each other. You have, uh, Dr. Nimoy Thompson talked about Ghana and boarding school. We have a very peculiar situation. I'm not sure of another country with as many boarding schools as we have. So we have a peculiar situation. If we like the boarding school, there's nothing wrong with them, but we ought to be able to face and make them functional in the way in which they were set up. Mm. If it is a question of sharing, I think that this uh, COVID. One of the things we can do is to share resources. The Honorable Minister has already talked about being in Cape Coast and reaching the person in Tamale. It's already happening. How about picking the university with the strongest program in, let's say, medicine and linking them up? And all of this is also happening. We are even linking the doctors up so that the doctor in a small village, are we saying that until we send a big hospital to that village, nobody should get sick? Or nobody should get support. It's the same analogy for the schools. And that is why I'm responding the way I am. Yes, you know, we shouldn't always buy these studies. Oh, we are always behind. We are behind them. And for what reason? Where do we want our education to get to? And whenever I see right. this person, Thank you very much. Um, no, 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 Prof, if you can really bring your, your point to an end, it yes. will be great you know, in one minute. The, good. The question I ask myself is, you see, in all these studies, I'm sure uh, uh, Dr. Dutrum has also read a lot of them, like all of us. There's one missing link that I always find, and I said, I asked myself, so in what medium are the students taught? What is the medium of instruction? If 
the children of Malaysia were to be taught in infancy, how, what progress will they make? So there are all these things. I know they have all kinds of implications, and we want our students to reach, uh, you know, uh, international, but you don't reach the international without looking at your nation. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, let me bring you, um, Dr. Nimoy Thompson, briefly within one minute. What is your viewpoint? What is the way forward for us now? Just within one minute. You can come from the global perspective. You can also hit on the continent and then how we can situate it at uh, a local space as well. What is your viewpoint, the way forward? The first within point is the need for us to build consensus. Again, because yeah. the implications of education reforms are long lasting and they, they, we, we need to have some, if not a consensus, of some common ground on how we approach these things. Secondly, we should recognize the fact that with there's simply no country in the world with enough money to provide free boarding school education anywhere. We must recognize them. For us, the resources are becoming even tighter. Uh, when my mm -hmm. daughter was in, in, in uh, second boarding school and I would go to PTA, a substantial part of their monies or a budget was spent on emptying the septic tank and buying water, simply because the system was built for about one-tenth of the students who are there now. The place was overrun with uh, sachet water uh, uh, rubber because everyone had to drink from sachet water and, and uh, uh, water bottles. And then thirdly, I think innovation should really drive everything. And by innovation, I don't mean just technological innovation, but also thinking about the way we, we do things. I'm glad that uh, Professor uh, Jane, uh, Nana Juman did speak about uh, the, the issues that the Honorable Minister referred to about the limitations of these secondary schools. There's this assumption that every kid must walk to school. But if we're really serious, we can develop an efficient transport system to transport children to and from school on a daily basis, no matter where they are. And I'm sure the minister himself knows how it works in the states where they have the busing system. Kids are bused from their school, sometimes across town, and it works. So I don't see why we should use distance as an issue. And I'm, I'm very glad that uh, Prof did uh, point to that. Uh, issue. And then lastly, the issue of textbook, I textbooks. I have to go back to that. We need a very strong monitoring of who can write the textbook and then get it into the classrooms. Too many people are writing books who are not qualified. I've met this one particular book okay. that really enjoyed reading, but it was horrible. So we need to keep uh, our eye on the quality of textbook uh, also. All right. Uh, okay. Great. Thank you very much. And a uh, good conversation is the one that never ends. And I believe that one hour is not enough for us to really digest um, the, the subject matter. We have received some critical questions um, on our Q&A page, but we'll answer them by typing for you. We may not be able to answer them live um, because our time is up. We need to make way for the next presentation um, as well. Thank you so much, Honorable Deputy Minister of Education. Thank you, Professor Nana Opoku Ajeman, and then Dr. Ni Moitomsi for joining us and share your perspective of um, COVID-19 test on education system and then also the policy implications and the new pathway for us as a country and as a continent. We want to acknowledge our partners and that is um, AU Television and that is streaming live this conversation across the continent. And then also our partner university, we are privileged uh, to have um, African Development University in Niger. They are partnering us and other key institutions that have joined us. My name is Chris Sam. We'll give you the summary of this whole thing or this whole discussion in the Q&A session for you to read through and also contribute. Thank you for joining us. We'll make way for the next presentation. And this is Education Collaborative brought to you by Ashesi University. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you also. Thank you very much.